listening to the Inner Light program, and I'm Steve Fryer, your host. With me for this special edition of the Inner Light is Dr. Alberto Violdo, who is an American shaman and author of four books dealing with the practices of shamanism and healing. Dr. Violdo was born in Cuba in 1949, where he was exposed to the Afro-Indian healing traditions and rituals at a very early age. During his doctoral studies in psychology, he traveled to South America to research traditional methods of healing, and later he established the Biological Self-Regulation Laboratory at San Francisco State University in order to investigate the neuropsychology of healing. Dr. Violdo is author of four books, Millennium, Glimpses into the 21st Century, Healing States and Realms of Healing, Journey to the Island of the Sun, Return to the Lost City of Gold, and also the recently released The Four Winds, A Shaman's Odyssey into the Amazon, published by Harper and Rowe. Dr. Violdo is the founder of the Four Winds Society, which is an educational organization which presents courses in shamanism across the world. Dr. Violdo also leads expeditions to Bali, Peru, Europe, and the southwestern United States to study the shamanic practices of indigenous peoples. Dr. Violdo, welcome to the Inner Light Program. I'm happy you can be with us, and for those listeners who are not familiar with shamanism, perhaps you could provide us with your definition of shamanism, and then if you would, please tell us how your great adventure into the study of uh, shamanic practice and study began. Shamanism is a, is a practice you find in every primitive culture and tradition. It's not a religion, but it's a way of communing with heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. It's a way of walking with beauty and with elegance on the earth and is part of nature and you know we're we're the only people in the west that were ever kicked out of the garden that were ever kicked out of paradise no other tradition in the world the buddhists weren't the hindus weren't the native american peoples weren't and in their traditions they were given the gardens to be the stewards and caretakers of it so shamanism is a nature tradition of communing and being in balance with nature and with your own inner nature and it's a spiritual path as well. It's the path of the healer, the path of the warrior, the path of the sage, and the path of the visionary. How did you first become uh, introduced to shamanism? What was your the beginning of your great adventure? Well, my specialty are the Inca traditions. The, shaman, the shamanism that I've studied has been with the Incas in uh, Peru, in Machu Picchu. And my introduction was, was as an anthropologist. I first began looking at the mythology of the Incas and their healing practices and traditions, <clears throat> and little by little found myself becoming immersed in their fourfold path of knowledge that a man or woman who's following this path of knowledge and power would follow. And this path is described as the Inca medicine wheel. Mm -hmm with four very clear steps to becoming a person of knowledge. Now that is described in your book, The Four Winds? That's correct. Is that right? That's correct. And the, um, let me tell you a little bit about the medicine wheel, because it's okay. really the structure of shamanic uh, knowledge. It, it, it's divided into four cardinal points, and each one represented by a power animal. <coughs> so you begin in the south, for example, which is represented by the serpent, and where you come and learn the ways of the healer. And it's a place where you go to learn how to shed the past the way that the serpent sheds the skin. And particularly to shed that mythology of origin that tells us that we were kicked out of the garden, that we were disconnected from the earth, that we were disconnected from nature. And the, um, and the, and the, the serpent represents, and the serpent has gotten a really bad rap in the West. You know, it's the mm -hmm. one who brought us the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Right. But the serpent really represents the fluidity, the ability to flow with grace and with elegance through life, and to walk on the earth with beauty, and to learn how to shed our past the way the serpent sheds the skin. Because the way that we do it in the West is we shed our past a little bit at a time, and we usually pick that scale in the serpent's skin that's stuck the most so we can feel something. And the way you do it in the shamanic traditions is an act of love and an act of power 
where you shed it all at once, not only the bad, but also the good. You shed all of your attachments, all of the things that, that make you cling to a particular worldview or description or definition of yourself or of your own woundedness. And then you learn the ways of the healer. Uh, the serpent represents which is the self? The serpent is the self. The, the self. Wheel. Okay. <laughs> and they say in the south that one is never fully healed until you yourself become a healer. And the way you become a healer is not only by diagnosing and doing energy healing on others, but by being a good reporter, a good interviewer, a good newspaper person, a good street cleaner. A good whatever you're doing. A yeah, good whatever you're doing for the <laughs> world with everything you do. Um, well, we, we'd like to know a little bit about how you began your your journey. Uh, what what caused you to become interested in this, this whole path in the first place? Well, I looked at the limits of, I was trained as an anthropologist and a psychologist, and I looked at the limitations that we have in the West in our psychology. You know, from the minute that we were kicked out of the garden, mm -hmm. We developed a theology, a religion of redemption, where we had to redeem ourselves with God. And we also developed a psychology of redemption, where we had to redeem ourselves with mommy and daddy. And the Native American traditions and the Inca traditions have a theology of liberation, of freedom, and a psychology of freedom, where you test your own knowledge, where you test your own power to create a world that is filled with beauty. And, um, and that attracted me tremendously, because we, we cultivate pathologies in the West. You talk to people and they tell you how they're codependent or how right. they were hurt or wounded as a child, and, and they carry that throughout their lives with them. So that they're defining, we define ourselves in the West by who we were 35 years ago. That's right. And in the Native tradition, the Inca traditions, you define yourself by who you're becoming not by who you were. I like that. But you're, you're, you're growing and emerging into. So when you first went to South America, when was that to uh, study? No, it was almost too long ago. <laughs> 19, uh, 1970, 1971. And that, that uh, journey is described in your book, The Four Winds, yeah, which is a... Uh, Four Winds is about, it's really my discovery of the Inca medicine wheel and these four steps to knowledge and power, and the four winds published by Inner Traditions. It's just being released uh, in September. And the, uh, but let me tell you a little bit more about the medicine wheel. Sure. Because from the south, the individual goes on to the west. From the place of the healer, and the place where we heal ourselves, you go on to the west, which is represented by the jaguar, and it's the place of the warrior. And, but it's not the warrior as we're familiar with him, <clears throat> but rather it's the warrior who has no enemies in this world or the next, who no longer has the need to create enemies. It's the way of the impeccable warrior, of the peaceful warrior, of the individual who lives his or her life with impeccability and with grace and who's learned how to step beyond death, who's no longer haunted by death. See, in the shamanic tradition, <clears throat> the Death is seen as something that grows within you and that you have to shed so that you're claimed by life and therefore you can never be claimed by death. And, and we all know people that are more dead than alive and that are still walking the streets and haven't had the courtesy of disposing of their bodies. <laughs> in the Bible they call it the walking dead, do they not? The walking dead, and I think that there's such deadness in our culture. But what the, what the warrior of the West does is their prime task is to live life free of death, free of the grip that death has on us, and free of fear, and to live the, the, the magical life. And the, um, and the way that one steps beyond death is to step beyond fear, and also to step beyond violence, so that, so that violence no longer lives in you, so that we no longer subscribe to a culture of violence. Or a culture of aggression. So we practice action. So we practice nonviolence, and we practice a mindful peacefulness in our lives that permeates everything that we touch and everywhere we walk. We're speaking with Alberto Vialdo, who is psychologist and shaman, 
and author of four books on shamanic practice and uh, healing. And you're listening to the Inner Light program. And uh, we'll be back with more from Dr. Violdo when the Inner Light continues. And we're back. This is Steve Fryer, and you're listening to the Inner Light program. And with me on the show is Alberto Violdo, Ph.D., psychologist and shaman and author of the book The Four Winds and a few others on the topic of shamanism. Before the break we were talking about uh, the path of the medicine wheel and we covered the south and the west and uh, I should also mention that uh, Dr. Violda will be in uh, Evanston, or the Wilmet area, on uh, September 23rd for the weekend doing a workshop on uh, soul retrieval, a soul retrieval intensive. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that, Dr. Violdo. What is a soul retrieval intensive and what do you do in that workshop? Well, soul retrieval is a, it's a shamanic practice of recovering those parts of ourselves that we have lost or compromised in the course of time and divorces and separations and, and painful experiences in life. Like paying taxes? Like paying taxes. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, but we get no refunds soul retrieval work. <laughs> See, the, um, in, in the, the primitive conception and the primal conception of the soul, of the psyche, <clears throat> Jungian psychologists speak about the collective unconscious that we all are, uh, are swimming in, so to speak. It's a sea of consciousness that we swim in. Mm-hmm. And the, um, you know, what happens in the course of our lives is that are, as a result of painful or difficult experiences, that we lose parts of our soul, we compromise parts of our soul. And whereas you can work on this therapeutically, on a painful experience that you may have had when you were six or seven, a violation, any, any kind of, of difficult experience, mm-hmm. and understand it better, <clears throat> and understand yourself better and how that influences your life, the process of soul retrieval is designed, is a shamanic process designed to, discuss, to recover the vitality and the energy and the playfulness and the youthfulness that you lost as a result of that experience so that it works more on an energetic level than on a psychological one. So you recover a part of yourself that you haven't had in 20 years or 25 years and that returns a, a power and an energy that has been missing in our lives. So that would explain why a lot of people are suffering from depressions and, and mental illness and uh, various other diseases, because they, they don't really have their full energy to work with? The, um, I, I don't want to explain away all mental illness mm-hmm. in terms of soul retrieval. But what we can say is that, for example, in, the, in our Western conception, say that we had a painful ex- experience when we were six, somebody came and and uh, might have kidnapped us and abducted us for two days. And if you go to a therapist, they'll work on what it felt like to be kidnapped and what it feels like to be abandoned and and do you have any abandonment issues in your life right now? Mm -hmm. And how does that feel? If you work with a point of view of soul retrieval, what you would say is that instead of focusing on the experience of, say, that kidnapping, what you would focus on would be on the people involved. And you would say that, in effect, that we have captured part of their souls as well, that these are hungry ghosts that keep showing up in our dinner table and feeding off the scraps that fall off our plate. And what you want to do in a soul retrieval work is, is to set free these hungry ghosts from the past that continue to haunt us. So we don't build any karma with these people, so we don't have to be born again next life and deal with it all over again. Mm-hmm. So you set yourself free from them. Shutting the past seems to be a central theme of your work. How, how do you actually do this in a, in a soul retrieval intensive weekend? And can, how much can, re, can really be accomplished? Well, you can accomplish a lot. What we do in the weekend is, and we do not take people in this weekend program that are coming for intense personal healing. But rather, these are, this is a training in the techniques of soul retrieval and how we can use these techniques both to recover parts of ourselves that we have lost as well as with others to help others recover the essential and the core elements of ourselves. What is the luminous body? Uh, I've read, read a little bit of your literature. 
and it says that the soul retrieval aims to heal the luminous body. What is that? Well, the luminous body, you've, you've heard, of course, about the aura. Oh, sure. And in the shamanic traditions, we refer to it as a light body or as a luminous body. And the luminous body is, is a template, holds a template of how we live, mm -hmm. of how we get sick, of how we will die. And they are imprinted in the luminous body are both karmic as well as biological conditions that later express physically in the body. But you're saying that this template uh, can be changed in the luminous body. Absolutely. And this template cannot be changed psychotherapeutically. You cannot talk your way to change an energetic dynamic that exists in the luminous body. That has to be cleared energetically. How is, how is what you're doing with uh, soul retrieval different from uh, past life therapies we hear so much about? Well, in a, in a past life regression, you may have an experience of who you were in a former life mm -hmm. and relive some of that experience and relieve some of the psychological charge of that experience. You do not necessarily uh, repair the tears and the holes in your aura and your luminous body that exists from that experience. And that you must do energetically. That you have to do by attending directly to the luminous body. And um, unfortunately, we're not trained on how to work with, it, with the luminous body directly. How many people would you say, in your estimation, in uh, North America are trained to do this kind of work or anything close to it? Well, this is a technique that you find. Where, for example, I learned this in the Andes working with the Incas, where it, it goes back to 100,000 years ago. These are very ancient techniques for, for working with the body of light, working with energy. We're just beginning to rediscover these techniques in the West. Mm -hmm. And I would say that there's a handful of people in the U.S. That, that can do this effectively. But there's also many, many people that claim to be doing energy healing that sometimes are hurting people more than helping them. What would be some of the, uh, the warning signs well, to, to watch out for? I've had people come to my office with uh, suffering from cancer, people that have just been to, uh, to see Mm -hmm. a spiritual healer or an energy healer that is done laying on of hands and energy healing on them and their cancer has metastasized and spread throughout their body because cancer loves energy and we think that that it's frequently we end up doing spiritual healing the same way that a doctor does healing with medicines except instead of using 10 milligrams of Valium we're using 10 minutes of energy healing and the importance, see, in the shamanic traditions, nobody heals you. The body heals itself. And what you want to do is you want to disinhibit the natural healing systems of the body so that the body can heal itself very quickly. And much of the luminous healing, working with the luminous body, has to do with unblocking un the body's own self-healing mechanisms. Because, you know, we live in an immune-depressed culture. Our immune systems, mm -hmm. for most people, are functioning at, at, a, at, a, at 20% or 30%. And when you disinhibit those energy blocks that keep the immune system depressed, what you have is an extraordinary self-healing system in the body that will treat most any condition very effectively, whether it be physical or whether it be a karmic situation of soul retrieval, for example. Mm -hmm. um. Energetically, you don't differentiate between the biological and the spiritual. They're all energy systems. And when, you, when you get the body to heal itself, the body knows the way back to health. What the healer and what the shaman healer does is disinhibit those systems rather than to go in and try to fix something. What kind of things would you do uh, in a typical session with uh, someone to help them move into uh, being able to work and communicate with that luminous body? Is that something you can just think and, and have happen, or do you have to do some sort of ritual to move into that state? Well, one of the things that we do in our trainings, uh, for example, we do a week-long training in healing the light body, is to train people how to see the luminous body. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because it's important to get that direct feedback, to see what you're doing. When you can see these imprints in the luminous body, then you can work very effectively with them. So learning how to, to perceive these spaces in between things, 
where most everything is happening anyway is, is vital. It's very, very important in this work, how to sense, how to develop your senses so you not only sense energy, but you can see it. So the average uh, participant could learn to see the energy? Oh, absolutely. In it's a short period of time? I'm sorry? It's, it's uh, fairly easy to do? Well, it's not that easy to do, but it, <laughs> if you imagine that what you're seeing out in the world anyway is just a bunch of photons of light that are hitting your eyes mm -hmm. and are being sent to the back of the head to the visual cortex in the brain where an image is created that we think is out there. But in effect, what's really out there are all of these little photons of light bouncing around. And the image is happening inside the head. So if you have someone who can sense energies and you know how to lay those extra cerebral circuits, mm -hmm. those neurological pathways back to the visual cortex of the brain, suddenly you're able to see. Now, many <laughs> people... with the eyes that we... You don't see with the senses that we're accustomed to so in our everyday life. So you're really training people to move beyond the limitations of the five senses. Well, you know, the shamanic traditions are perceptual traditions. They're based on perception. So learning how to perceive and sense is really vital. Let me give you an example of this. Okay. You know, we're, we're people of the West, and we're people of the precept. We, we get laws, we get Ten Commandments, we get rules regulations. We're people of the precept. The Greeks were people of the concept. They didn't get rules, they got ideas. Shamans are people of the percept. If shamans want to change something, they don't pass a new law about it, a new rule. They don't get a new idea about it. They change or, or a crime bill. They change their perceptual <laughs> relationship to it. So learning your how you perceive the world and being able to perceive the world differently or perceive your own past differently changes your relationship to it completely. Um, many of us uh, have read and become captivated with the uh, writings of Carlos Castaneda. And I guess uh, it'd be interesting to have you compare or contrast you know, your work in shamanism uh, with uh, that of uh, the experiences of Castaneda. How are you, how, how is what you're doing similar or, or not similar? Similar and it's very different at the same time. I, I am a great admirer of Castaneda's work. I think that he has opened the doorways into this domain for many, many people. And at the same time, Castaneda was a sorcerer, not a shaman. If you look back at Castaneda's books, there is not a single instance of healing in any of his books, for example. Or uh, uh, use of, of love? Or, or, or the word love is not even mentioned. In mm -hmm. fact, fear is what he comes up against. <laughs> and a terrible relationship with women. So the path of the sorcerer is different from the path of the shaman. The path of the shaman is really founded on love, on, on living your life as an act of love and an act of power. But it's not the kind of love that we use to barter for each other's affections. Mm -hmm. It's the kind of love that a flower feels for the rain or a rock for the lightning. Found throughout all of nature, love is the operating principle in nature. Um, what does it take? So that's really what the key difference there between those two. Well, that's that's good, really good to know because sometimes you read something and it seems to make sense, and uh, after a while you say it really does. There's something wrong with this, and you really can't put your finger on it. Yeah. Uh, I found that uh, with Scientology. I looked into that many years ago, and it made sense logically, but it didn't really feel right. You know, and eventually, a few years later, I figured out it didn't have any heart to it. What Castaneda says, you have to follow a path with the heart. Um, <coughs> See, this goes back to the medicine wheel. We spoke about the South and the West, <coughs> which is the place of the healer in the South and the place of the warrior in the West. Then you come to the North, which is the place of the sage and the place of the ancient teachings mm -hmm. and, you, and the place of mastery. And, but to get to this place of the sage, you need to have done your work of the South, of self-healing. You need to have to understand and to have healed yourself. And the work of the West, which is the work of the warrior, which is learning how to live with impeccability, which is different from being perfect. People confuse the two sometimes. <clears throat> Shamans are not perfect people at all. They're very imperfect. But they live their lives impeccably. And then you can go on to the North, which is the place of the ancient teachings, the place of the sage. 
if you don't do the personal work in the South and the West before, where you end up with, with a lot of spiritual cliches in the North, they're all true, but that have no power in your life. We need to take a short break here, uh, Dr. Vieldo. Um, you're listening to the Inner Light Program, and I'm with Dr. Alberto Vieldo, who is a psychologist and shaman. We're speaking long distance, and uh, we'll have more on uh, the path of the medicine man when the inner light continues. Uh, Dr. Violdo, before the break, we were talking about uh, the way of the medicine man, and that's uh, uh, we were talking about the south and then the west, and, and now uh, I think we could get into the north way and, and what that represents to the medicine man. In the medicine wheel represents the way of the sage, the way of mastery, mm -hmm. and it's the um, um, and it's the place where one goes to to learn the ancient teachings, to receive the ancient teachings, and uh, and this is happening not only for the individual but you know collectively as well for all of us. I read recently that there was a white buffalo calf born uh, somewhere in America. And, um, well, I think that happened uh, right up here in Wisconsin, uh, right close by. I heard it uh, mentioned on one large radio talk show station here in Chicago, and uh, they were everybody was very amazed. And the woman who owned the buffalo had commented that uh, people were calling from all over the country and starting to come by and see it. And this was the first or second day it had been born. Yeah. What's the meaning of the white buffalo? You know, the uh, this is part of the Native American prophecies that speak about the birth of a white buffalo marking the beginning of the return of the ancient teachings. So this is very important for Native peoples, for the Cherokee, for example. The Hopi traditions are also expecting this return of a, of a sign like this one. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, so this is very exciting, but we'll get to that a little bit later when we speak about the Inca and the Mayan and the Hopi prophecies. That'd be great. And, um, but you know, the, the work of the North is the work of mastery. And in the shamanic traditions, you have to do the work of the South and the work of the West before you get to the North. Otherwise, all of these teachings become quaint little spiritual cliches that don't have power in your life. And the, um, for example, my mentor used to tell me that while everybody has a future, only very few people have a destiny. And a destiny doesn't have to be a big destiny. You don't have to be president of the world. But it has to be a meaningful destiny and one that has significance and meaning in it. Well, I think we're all, we're all looking for meaning in our lives, or uh, people even go to workshops to find out their life purpose. It seems to be a very important uh, topic these days. Oh, absolutely. But see, the difference in the shamanic approach is that you don't go anywhere looking for meaning. When you come, when you come to the north in the medicine wheel, <clears throat> the task of the shaman at that point becomes to bring meaning to every action that they do and to bring truth to every action that they do, rather than to quest for truth or to quest for meaning. That sounds very Zen, in some ways. Well, Zen is a shamanic path of sorts. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of urban shamanism. <laughs> so how do you take shamanism into uh, your everyday life? How do you use it? Well, the, uh, I don't differentiate between shamanism and my everyday life. And, uh, and <clears throat> no, Steve, I don't think that we live really in a democracy in this country. I think that we live in a mediocracy. <laughs> Good word. And <laughs> I like that. The mediocrity that we have out there is extraordinary. And the question, of course, is do we want to subscribe to the kind of reality that someone else chose it for us? And let's put out... always common denominator. Or do we want to subscribe to one where uh, adventure and mystery and the enigma and the joy of life is going to surprise us at every turn that we make? So you're really advocating uh, taking one's power back, really taking it back. Well, you know, discovering our power, I don't think that we can take back what we don't know that we had in the first place. It really becomes an epic journey to discover our power and our wisdom. You know, for example, we live in a world that is disenchanted, that is inanimate. They accuse us of being animistic. Of course we're animistic. You know, rocks talk to us, trees talk to us, clouds speak to me. And we live in an inanimate world, in a world where the anima, where the soul mm -hmm. has been taken out of it. And part of our task today is really to reanimate the world, 
to bring the anima back into it, to bring the enchantment back into the world, to bring the mystery of walking outside at night and looking at the stars and realizing your smallness, but also your importance in the plan of creation. There seems to be a major trend. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I met a man named Michael Rhodes who wrote a book, Talking to Nature, mm -hmm. and uh, Listening to Nature, and uh, he's talking about exactly what you're saying, uh, hearing the voice within all the various aspects of nature, right. and at the same time still realizing that it's really part of himself. There's yeah. no there's no separation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very beautiful, uh, b beautiful series of books out of Australia. And that was, uh, I would have to say, more of a self-discovery. It wasn't something he went and, and sought so much, but took the time to go down by the river and, and sit there and contemplate. And I thought it was just a beautiful uh, uh, pathway to awakening, yeah. as is yours. And uh, I highly recommend your book, The Four Winds. I haven't read it all yet, but uh, in a way, when I was, I was reading it, it seemed that this was uh, perhaps the real Celestine prophecy journey uh, maybe you could comment on that, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the huge success of that book, which is, of course, uh, uh, you know, more of a, a novel. It's not yeah. based on too much real experience, but perhaps some. And uh, James Redfield admits that. I met him. Um, but still, you know, it's sort of an indicator of where we're going as a society and what we long yeah. for, you know. Absolutely. What's your take on that? Well, the shamanic traditions are really practical. They say that there's a body of prophecy that's a, that's, that are possibilities, but that we have to invite those possibilities into our lives. These, these are very practical traditions, you know. You have to be able to grow corn with it and not <laughs> just have another spiritual insight. And, the, for example, we work with power animals. And the shaman will differentiate between information and knowledge. When I first started doing my work in South America, the... Um, <laughs> The shaman that I work with would say to me, you know, Alberto, you have a lot of information, but, but very little knowledge. And I say, how do you know that? You know, I've, I've, I've got a PhD. And he says, yeah, but you have no power animals. <laughs> and, the, uh, and the power animal is a very interesting concept in shamanism because it is more than a symbol. In fact, it represents a part of ourselves that is salcha, that's, that is undomesticated. We live far too domesticated lives, you know. And it represents an undomesticated part of ourselves that we are always in the process of discovering. And that, um, and when you engage with the power animal in shamanism, what you do is you make an agreement with power and knowledge to begin to stalk you. So you're not only the stalker and the hunter, you know that you're also being stalked. <laughs> you're also being hunted. So you don't say, well, next Friday at 5.30 in the afternoon after work, Maybe I'll engage in a little shamanic work. <laughs> no, because it's going to stalk you and it's going to take you by the scruff of the neck when you least expect it and say, here I am. Probably in the middle of that board meeting yeah. with an important sales call. Absolutely. <laughs> and you've got to be ready for it. See, for the, for the shaman, there's no difference between being killed by a microbe or being killed by a lion. Really? For us, one of them is a disease and the other one is an unfortunate accident. But for the shaman... You have to be in harmony with all of creation, whether it be the very, very small or the very, very big. And, the, um, and if you happen to walk down the path with their lions, you better be ready to make friends with them very quickly. Uh, do you advise people to go out and find a shaman to study with? And if so, where would they, they find a reliable, if there is such a thing, reliable shaman? Well, you know, I advise people to go out into nature uh -huh. and learn from nature. See, in, in this path, there's no, there's no Buddha, there's no Christ, there's no Muhammad that says, follow my footsteps. In this path, you follow your own footsteps, and you learn from nature. And if you happen to find a good shaman that will help you to verify your experience and validate it, wonderful. But everything, everything that we need to know and to learn is immediately available around us. Uh, I'm kind of curious, since you're a, a psychologist, uh, are you still active in, in your practice at all, or are you more or less going on these adventures all the time? No, I, I do very little psychology anymore. Uh, most of my work is, is teaching. I teach, like I'm coming up to Chicago shortly, and, I'm, um, and I teach throughout the country, and in Europe as well. You're more in the, in the class, class setting? No, not in the class setting, in the workshop setting. Workshop, I mean, yes. And then we also lead 
journeys to Peru where I take people up to Machu Picchu and we sit there in the middle of the night and meditate with the spirits of the mountains and with the wind. And we also do journey training programs in healing the light body and expeditions to the canyon lands in the southwest. So, you know, there's, there's only so much of this that you can do in a, in a conference room. Mm -hmm. You really need to go out to nature, meditate at, at, at midnight in the ancient Hopi cliff dwellings, Anasazi cliff dwellings, and feel yourself in nature with lightning around you and, um, and taste the, the beauty and the power and the awesomeness of, of these environments. Are you finding yourself um, uh, being crowded by other uh, spiritual groups uh, who are on uh, spiritual vacations and seeking uh, to these uh, places? I hear so many people that uh, are going or have gone to Machu Picchu or and other sacred sites. Uh, when you get there, are you are you finding yourself crowded out by some of the other groups, or is it? No, not at all. The places that we go to, heart, the only people that go to, they go there are Indians. Even when we go to Machu Picchu, we go into the ruins at nighttime when they're closed to tourists. And we have them all to ourselves with maybe a dozen medicine people that are doing ceremony there at the same time. So it's a, you, you would consider it a valid experience then, not just a, a tourist stop? Well, I, a valid experience is, uh, it absolutely is, because what happens is that the other tourists leave at six in the evening to go back and take hot showers and uh, have <laughs> full meals. Right. And you to experience some of these places, you have to be out in Machu Picchu at midnight as the energies change and the place comes alive and you begin to see ceremonies happening in front of you that happened a thousand years ago. What's the, You're actually seeing through the veil of time itself. What's the, uh, the significance of uh, being there at midnight? What is, what is different and uh, why is it different, do you suspect? Daylight is not the best light to see the spiritual domain by. At night time, you can, if, if your senses are open and you're open mm -hmm. to, to your own heart, you can peer into dimensions that are very difficult to perceive in the harsh light of daylight. I see. There, there's, so much, see there's so much happening in the spaces in between things. Um. You know, in the West, we're told that there are two states that exists, science tells us that there's energy and there's matter. And that's Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared. And in the shamanic world, we recognize that there is energy and there is matter, but most of it happens in a dance on top of that equal sign, <laughs> in between states. What's your opinion of the uh, use of hallucinogens in the shamanic uh, practice or study? It's been uh, you know, quite a bit of our culture with since uh, Timothy Leary, uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, what's your recommendation on the use of hallucinogens? Well, the, the plant medicines are frequently used, and I emphasize the plant medicines, are sometimes used in the jungle as part of your shamanic training. But they're never used out of context, and they're always used ritually, and under the supervision of a, of a master shaman. And you may do it once a year, and then maybe never again. Um, in the Andes, among the Incas, the plant medicines are very rarely used. And I don't think you need to use them at all. I think that all of these states are accessible. You Where don't. they are helpful sometimes is in, in destructuring some of the cultural crud that we have embedded in our own souls that limits our perceptions and our possibilities, that tells us how to have an orgasm, and, and that it takes 30 days to heal from this particular illness or that we're going to die in this particular way or that particular way. So to break those cultural patterns so we can open ourselves to a new perceptual domain, that's the main use of these, of these plant substances. But they never use chemicals. And even, and I don't advocate the use of any of, any of the mind-altering substances. I think our minds are like exquisitely tuned Ferraris. You're not going to put uh, low-grade gasoline into it. <laughs> We're speaking with Dr. Alberto Vialdo, who will be here in the uh, Wilmette area on Friday, September 23rd through the 25th, giving a soul retrieval intensive. And uh, we'll have more in our final segment with Dr. Vialdo when the inner light continues. 
and we're back. You are listening to the Inner Light Program, and I'm Steve Fryer, your host. And with me on the line is Dr. Alberto Viodo, who will be here in uh, Wilmette on Friday, September 23rd, for a Soul Retrieval Intensive. And uh, we were talking about shamanism and all the various aspects, and I think we had perhaps one more uh, point to cover on the medicine wheel. What is, what is that, Dr. Viodo? Last step in the medicine wheel is the direction to the, of the east, journey to the east. And that's the most difficult journey for the medicine person to undertake because that involves, that's the way of the visionary. And that involves learning that there are two kinds of time, that there's ordinary time that kind of flies like an arrow where the future always follows the present and the past, it's already gone. And there's another kind of time which is sacred time that turns like a wheel. It's polychronic time, where you can actually influence events that happened in the past or, or nudge destiny. And the ability to step outside of time becomes critical for the medicine person. Now, how difficult is that for you, who, you know, you've been in this a long time, to get into polychronic time outside of linear time? Well, the, uh, see, the thing about linear time that linear time is causal. There's always cause and effect. Mm -hmm. If you look at psychology, psychology is based on linear time, that, that who you are today was shaped by who you were 35 years ago, or something that happened to you yesterday or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing with the, with the causes of today's effects. Medicine is the same way. What is the cause of this particular condition? In sacred time, there's no causes. There are only effects. Or the cause for an event could happen two months from today the cause for something that takes place today. So that you break, f and, and because when you live in linear time, linear time is pretty, is much, very deterministic. Things have already been etched in stone, pretty much. When you step outside of linear time, you enter the domain of possibilities, of, of potentialities. Let me give you a very direct example okay. of Okay, we love that. Uh, medicine tells you that uh, the that the way that we age is kind of like making a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. The cells in our skin, for example, divide every six days, and they make a copy of themselves from the last copy. And by the time you get to the 99th photocopy, it starts <laughs> getting a little fuzzy around the edges. It gets a little old. <laughs> yeah, it's aging. That's how aging happens, according to biology. That's very interesting. I had, had never heard that analogy before. Well, but shamans say that that's not the way it works. Shamans say that you don't need to make the 98th photocopy from the 97th, that you can actually make it from the first one, from the source that informs all of life. That if you're in tune with that source, that you can inform, that you can change the way you age, that we can change the way that we, that we live, that we can change the way that we heal, that we can change the way we die, that we don't have to die. And that involves stepping into a different kind of time, into, into, into sacred time. Well, perhaps in the, in the few remaining minutes, uh, you could uh, perhaps give our listeners um, a clue, you know, or maybe a way to uh, help shift their, their everyday ordinary perception and help move them to uh, more of a, a uh, polychronic basis. And we have two and a half minutes to do this. Well, just, just a, a, something to do, you know. <laughs> the, uh, I think that the, the science tells us that, for example, quantum physics, that quantum phenomena is happening at the very, very small level, at the molecular level or the subatomic level, and also at the very, very large, at the level of creating galaxies. But that is not happening at our level, in the middle. Well, that's not true. Shamans say that it is happening here, that we can step outside of ordinary time, that we can perceive events that are happening at a distance that we can change events that happen in our past, or at least our relationship to them, how we hold them. And in meditative states, for example, in the, in the shamanic meditations, you learn techniques for slowing time down or accelerating time. For example, you can accelerate the passage of time very locally around a wound so that you have 30 days worth of healing happening in, in three days. And this is access to certain states of consciousness or certain states of awareness that you learn to cultivate and to practice. And the best way to get to that is through meditation. But meditation in nature, 
And mm -hmm. the meditative practice of the shaman has to do with realizing that we're sitting on the lap of the Pachamama, of, the, of Mother Earth. That we're sitting on her lap, that she's holding us, rocking us gently like a mother. That she's a mother that never left us. And meditating on that awareness, meditating on the high mountaintops, meditating on the stars. So these are the three points of meditation of the Andean medicine person on the Pachamama, on the Mother Earth. So in the, fi in the final uh, minute or two, uh, perhaps you could give us your uh, uh, quick summary of uh, you know, the, the Mayan prophecy. Where are we headed, if you, you see, in the next uh, 10, 20 years? Well, you know, the curious thing is that the Mayan, the Inca, and the Hopi prophecies all end around this time. The Hopi speak about it, are emerging into the fifth world. The Incas talk about the arrival of the fifth sun. The Mayans talk about the end of history as we know it. And all of the Native American prophecies speak about a time of great opportunity right now. And I believe that we've all chosen to incarnate in this earth at this time because we didn't want to miss out on this party. What a lot of fun. <laughs> and, uh, and we're taking quantum leap into who we're becoming, into developing new bodies, into developing new minds, new consciousness and new physical bodies in the process. And, uh, and all of the native prophecies point to this happening now. So the question today is not can we, but dare we. You know, dare we take this quantum leap into the future? So it's a choice that we have to make. It's a choice that each one of us individually has to make in a commitment to our own soul's path. And shamanism is one of those ways, maybe one of the most direct ways that I've experienced. And for those of your readers who of your listeners who are interested in pursuing this further, you know, please come and join me in Chicago. The program's coming to an end, and uh, we'll have to shift our perception <laughs> back to a more linear state. Well, thanks for inviting me to be with you this evening. Well, we, we really appreciate your being here and taking the time out of it. I know what is a very busy schedule, and uh, uh, we'd all appreciate having you back again sometime when uh, the opportunity presents itself. Thank you. So thanks for being with us on The Inner Light. Thank you.